Now the last thing that I'd like to do in this series of videos is I'd like to give a couple of definitions. The definition of a principal ideal and the definition of a principal ideal domain, which we're going to denote by PID. So let's go ahead and get those definitions going. A principal ideal of a commutative ring R is an ideal of the form, uh, the ideal generated by A, where A is some arbitrary element, some specific element of the ring. A principal ideal domain is an integral domain in which every single ideal of the domain happens to be a principal ideal. Now I'm going to go ahead and give some examples. We're going to see an additional example as we go on in this slide. And in fact, there are many examples of PIDs and things that are not PIDs that I'm not going to be covering in this collection of videos. However, these are things that we're going to deal with a little further on in the course when we have a little bit more machinery to work with. For example, our first example is that our most familiar and our most comfortable example of a domain does happen to be a principal ideal domain or a PID. This is the fact that I'm using is that every ideal of the integers is of the form n times z for some positive integer n. And the ideal n times z is just another way of saying ideal generated by little n. This is a fact. This is something we're actually going to prove uh, later on. This will be the next collection of slides. Something that we're not going to prove, but which is a helpful example to keep in mind, is that it is not true that all integral domains are PIDs. For example, z adjoined x, which is this polynomial ring with integer coefficients, is not a PID. And the example that you're looking for is if you look at the ideal of z adjoined x, which is the collection of all polynomials that happen to have an even constant term, then this is not a principal ideal. And you should have dealt with this ideal and this ring in a previous homework problem. Um, so this should be a somewhat familiar example to you. Returning to something that is an example, and here an example that you can easily prove is a PID, is that any arbitrary field f happens to, be IP, happens to be a PID. Now we should have seen at this point in time in the semester that a field only has two ideals. That's the trivial ideal, the ideal containing 0, and the whole field f. These ideals are generated by 0 and 1 respectively. So the, the set that just contains 0 happens to be the ideal generated by 0, and the whole field f can be generated as an ideal by the number one. Now, what I'd like to do on this slide is actually show very explicitly that the integers are a PID. What I want to do this for is I want to give a little bit of a caution and a word of warning so how hard it can actually be to show that something is a PID. And what I mean is that to show an integral domain is a PID, what you need to do is start with an arbitrary ideal i and show that it's generated by a single element. Now, when you think about ideals of a particular domain or even of a ring, you often think about the easy ways to generate ideals. My caution is you have to be aware of the fact that there are lots and lots of ways to build ideals and come up with ideals, and you need to be prepared for all of those situations. So for instance, I've asserted without proof that every ideal of the integers is just of the form n times z. That is true and is what we'll prove on this page, but before I know that, I have to be thinking about all types of weird and strange examples, such as the ideal generated by 2 intersected with the ideal generated by 9. It happens to be the case that that is the ideal generated by something else, some other number, um, and I would have to show explicitly what that is. Or for instance, Here's an ideal with three generators. Let's consider the ideal generated by 77, 91, and 784. I'm thinking of that in one way as I've constructed it as the ideal generated by three things. I'm almost thinking about it in a contradictory way. It's the explicitly was built as the ideal generated by three things, not one thing. But if I would have chosen something else, some other element of that particular ideal, I could kind of eliminate some of these generators and think of this ideal as the ideal generated by a single element. Um, now I think that it may actually, if you're looking for 
something to toy around with or something to play with to see and really understand what this complication is, I'd suggest using these examples. So get your hands dirty, work with this specific ring, which is the integers, work with these specific ideals, and see if you can come up with an explicit generator for each of these um, ideals. Now, I'm hoping that you pause the video if that was something that you wanted to do, because right now I'm going to give away the game, and I'm going to actually do the proof that an arbitrary ideal of the integers happens to be a principal ideal by showing you what the generator should be. So let's suppose that i is an ideal of the integers. One of the cases that we need to consider is that i is just the trivial ideal, the set that contains zero. But this case is going to be easy for us. This is going to be the case where the ideal i is the ideal generated by 0. And so we can assume that this is not the ideal we've chosen. We may assume that we've chosen an ideal with more than just the 0 element in it. So the very next line of the proof is, let's pick an element in the ideal that isn't 0. We know we can do that. But let's pick it with an additional property. Let's pick an element of the ideal that isn't 0 and where we have an element that has a minimal absolute value. Now what we need to do, I'm claiming that this element, this non-zero element with minimal absolute value, is a generator for the ideal i. So what I want to do to show that is I want to pick b to be another arbitrary element of the ideal, and I want to show that it's a multiple of this element a. So what I'll do is I'll use this idea of the quotient remainder theorem. I'll take the element b, I'll write it as some quotient times the number a, plus a remainder. And the very important thing to note here is that we have some bounds on what the remainder can be. If we're using this division algorithm slash quotient remainder theorem, which holds in the integers, then I know that the value of this remainder, it's a positive number, or a non-negative number, I should say, and it has to be a number that's smaller than the absolute value of a strictly smaller. Now my next argument is that b minus qa belongs to i. So let's justify that why that's true. I've chosen the element a to belong to the ideal i, and because i is an ideal, when I multiply a by any ring element, in particular q, I get another element of the ideal. Now I've also selected b to be an element of the ideal, and ideals are subrings, and subrings are closed under subtraction. So when I'm looking at something of the form b minus qa, I'm looking at an element of the ideal minus an element of the ideal, and that's going to result in an element of the ideal. Since b minus qa is an element of the ideal, and it happens to be equal to r, what we know is that r is an element of the ideal as well. However, this element r, by this quotient remainder theorem, is a number that's smaller than the absolute value of a. And this is where it becomes important that we selected a to be minimal with respect to absolute value. So if I have a number that belongs to the ideal i and has a smaller absolute value than a, then the only option is that that r is the zero element. That means that r is zero. We've written, as b, we've written b as q times a, and that means that b belongs to the ideal generated by a. It's a multiple of a. B was an arbitrary element of the ideal i, so what we've shown with this argument is in fact that the ideal i is contained in the ideal generated by a. Now the reverse containment is automatic. The ideal generated by a is contained in the ideal i since a is an element of i, and the ideal generated by a is the smallest ideal that happens to contain i. And because we have both containments, we can conclude that the two sets are equal, so the ideal i is the ideal generated by a, and the integers form a PID. Now, if you'd like to know the answer for the question that I gave you up here, at least the ideal generated by 77, 91, and 784, I think you'll notice that 7 is the greatest common divisor of those three numbers, and so I think if I were picking an ideal, or an element of that ideal, that was non-zero and had minimal absolute value, I could pick the number 7. And so secretly, the ideal generated by 77, 91, and 784 is the ideal generated by 7. Now, one more example of something that happens to form a PID 
The theorem is if we start with a field F, then when we look at the polynomial ring F adjoined X, we get a PID. Now note that we really and truly need for F to be a field here. It's not enough for F to be an integral domain, since one of the examples we've given is that the integers are an integral domain, and the, integral, the integers adjoined X are not a PID. So we really need the full strength that F is a field here. But if we start with a field and then look at F adjoined X, what results is a PID. And we're going to prove this, and just as a little bit of foreshadowing for some things that we're going to cover in the future, I'd like you to look at this proof really closely and compare it with the proof on the previous slide where we proved that the integers were a PID. So compare strategies in terms of what we're doing and see if you can try and think of a more general way that we could go about showing that something is a PID. Now, one of the properties that we've seen in the previous slide is that you start if you start with an integral domain and you adjoin x, then the resulting polynomial ring is in fact also an integral domain. So that was something we saw in the previous some of the previous slides and properties of polynomial rings. But a field is in particular an integral domain, so f adjoined x is going to be an integral domain. So that's the first part of showing that something's a PID, it certainly has to be a domain. Now we have to do the principal ideal part. So what we're going to do is again pick i to be a non-zero ideal of this integral domain f adjoined x, and let's pick a polynomial g of x inside the ideal that isn't zero, and similar to picking something with absolute value, what I want to do here is I want to pick g of x to have minimal degree. Now, let's let f of x be another arbitrary element of i, and my real claim is that this ideal i is equal to the ideal generated by g of x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my quotient remainder theorem to take f of x and write it as q of x g of x plus r of x according to the quotient remainder theorem. Now it's subtle, but this is where I've actually used that the thing that I started with is a field. We said earlier in these slides that I'm only allowed to take a polynomial of larger degree. It has to have larger degree because I've picked g of x to have minimal degree. And I can only use the quotient remainder theorem if I'm positive that the leading coefficient of the thing that I'm dividing by is a unit. This is where I've used the, that I have a field because no matter what the leading coefficient was on this polynomial g of x, it had to be something other than zero, and anything other than zero in a field is an invertible element or a unit. So this is where I've secretly used that f as a field, um, is in being able to know that I can write f of x as q of x, g of x plus r of x according to this quotient remainder theorem or this division algorithm. Now, now the rest of the proof should proceed in a similar way. It follows that the degree of r of x is strictly less than the degree of g of x. Again, we've selected f and g to both be polynomials that belong to the ideal i. Since i is an ideal, when I take q of x and multiply it by g of x, this still belongs to i. And therefore, the difference, one element of the ideal minus another element of the ideal, is still going to belong to the ideal. The difference between f of x and q of x, g of x, by this equality that I have above, is r of x. Now, we've found this polynomial r of x. It has degree less than g of x. That's insured to us by the quotient remainder theorem. And I've just shown that r of x belongs to the ideal. But g of x was special. When I chose g of x, I chose it to be a non-zero element of minimal degree. Now here's an element of the ideal, r of x, and it has degree less than g of x. Our only conclusion is that r of x must be equal to zero, because there isn't anything in, that belongs to i um, that has degree less than g other than this element zero. When we go back to our decomposition, now we're done. The polynomial f of x is a multiple of the polynomial g of x. f of x was arbitrary, and in the same way as we did on the previous slide, we conclude that this arbitrary ideal we started with is secretly the ideal generated by g of x.
This concludes everything we want to discuss in terms of polynomial rings, but I'd like to summarize the things we've covered over these three videos. After studying these slides, consulting your textbook for more examples if you need, and working the exercises, my hope is that you should be able to perform familiar procedures such as polynomial multiplication and long division when I give you a non-standard polynomial ring. So if I give you something like z mod 5 adjoined x, z mod 6 adjoined x, my hope is that you should be able to perform these computations um, inside of those rings. The second thing I'd like you to know is I'd like you to know multiple ways of using the fact that an element a is a root of the polynomial f. So this goes back to the proof. What I'm really referring to here is to go back to the proof of the fact that the polynomial x minus a divides the polynomial f if and only if a is a root of f. This is something that should be kept fresh in your mind for later on in the semester. The next thing I'd like you to do is understand and know by heart the definition of a PID, and I'd also like you to be aware of the hardships or the complications that come along with proving that a particular domain is a principal ideal domain. Um, it can be a hard thing to understand what the real difficulty in showing something as a PID is, and I want to make sure that you understand that complication. And last but not least, I'd like you to hopefully be able to replicate, in terms of specific examples, the procedure that I used on the previous slide and the slide before to show that a particular ideal is a principal ideal.